Hello, everyone. Welcome to another interview special to YouTube. We are joined by Clara Del Villar of FreedomWorks, where she is the director of senior initiatives. And we're going to talk about a gamut of issues. But Clara, why don't you introduce yourself? Good afternoon, Gabby, and thank you for having me this afternoon. I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, Gabby, I've been with a FreedomWorks for the last few years as director of senior initiatives and retirement readiness. Um, but what that really means is helping people understand how to get more out of their savings, how different policies coming from DC impact your pocketbook, and what that means for the long-term stability for your future financial freedom. Could you explain in particular what those issues are? Sure. Um, in many ways, what we try to do is translate um, what free market thinkers such as ourselves discuss when we discuss low tax rates or we discuss less cumbersome regulation or we discuss a fear of huge Washington budget deficits. What we really want to do is translate that in simple terms so that people understand what that means for your dollars and cents in your pocketbook. So for instance, when it's discussed that only the rich, you know, the rich we have to pay taxes or increase their taxes to pay their fair share, what we really translate is how that's how that impacts your own pocketbook. If you aren't in that rich man's or rich woman's category, what that really means, such as high, higher corporate taxes, higher income taxes, or more important, higher capital gains taxes, and how that really cuts the pie and impacts you. What has Freedom Works impressions been of these infrastructure bills? There's obviously two that are being mulled right now or discussed. More broadly, I think the 3.5 trillion one is going to be reintroduced, or the conversations behind it will be reignited uh, very soon. I think they come back to session next week. So, what do people have to be aware of that's contained in the infrastructure bill? Obviously, it'll increase the debt and deficit. That's certainly a given. But what in particular sticks out about the bill that's problematic? Right. What we really worry about, Gabby, and this one in particular, is that it's really intended. To, oh, let me give you the broad brush. It's really intended to remake the whole social fabric of the United States. What that means is there are tens of hundreds of billions of dollars for child care support, for elder care support, for climate change engagement. And, um, and basically what we worry about is that the distribution and organization of distributing funds along that line is so complex, so administratively almost impossible uh, that we really fear that it's rhetoric that's misplaced. And it just is a part of, unfortunately, the Democratic Party's agenda to really contain a huge sum of, sum of money. And with that money is a lot more power over our lives. It really won't make it easier for you to provide child care and it won't make it easier for you to take care of your parents. It's just a whole new pot of money that will probably make these services that exist now significantly more expensive. In the same way that if you notice student loans or um, healthcare costs, they've really gotten a lot more expensive because government money flowing the wrong way has really created a lot of havoc in pricing in these services. The same thing will happen if we really allow this huge $3.5 trillion bill to take place. What aspects of it in particular should viewers and watchers be concerned of? Obviously, I've talked about the PRO Act portion. I think people are sick of me talking about that, but what else of the bill is alarming or concerning? What policies or uh, initiatives that they're proposing? Well, I'm happy to dive into the PRO Act part of it because that um, there has been a movement in the last few days to put the PRO Act into the reconciliation bill. Right. Reconciliation bill is just a complex way of saying, we want this whole pie of, uh, of gadgets to be in one bill together so that we can just have one Senate vote on it. Uh, in the in the weeks to come. And the PRO Act, what's disturbing about it is that they're making a broad assumption that Americans want unions back again. Hmm. Somehow they'll get higher wages and more benefits. Meanwhile, 
corporation, corporations have never provided more benefits to employees, have raised wages significantly, and basically companies have acknowledged much more than the government has that Americans want flexibility in how and when they work. The reason that they're gig workers or the reason that gig workers have expanded so profoundly is that Americans want flexibility. They want to pursue maybe some wages in this field while they, while they create their own opportunities in other areas where they might be interested. I can't tell you how many uh, Uber drivers or Lyft drivers that share what their real ambition is, or they just arrived in this country a few months ago and they wanna dive into work right away. So those, the gig worker economy was created because of demand in many ways, you know, not necessarily because of dictates from the private sector. So uh, Democrats are portraying it in a way that where they really want the union vote or they want the union, uh, the union demographic to grow because that's really a part of their constituency. Yes, and I think an estimate from the Institute for the American Worker found that if the PRO Act were to be implemented, the uh, union, big labor particularly, would get about $3 billion more per two election cycle. So they would become very politically powerful. They already are, but even more so from that angle. And it's often cast in a light of being pro-worker, but it's actually pro-labor union versus pro-worker because worker is a very subjective term. I consider myself a worker as part of the gig economy, but I don't want to be unionized. And I think most of my fellow flexible workers, freelance workers also share that same sentiment, which is why this is going to be a brewing battle um, over that. But it, it is a political tool and the market is dictating where, and I think with recent mandates and, and news breaks uh, recently where workers are going to largely leave the nine to five workforce, I think the traditional workforce, because they don't want top down policies to interfere with their work. Uh, there's a lot of people leaving nine to five jobs under what is now called the great resignation. 10 million freelancers are expected to be created as a result of that. And I think with new mandates recently announced, I think we could expect that number to either double, maybe uh, increase a little bit more than that 10 million estimated number. So I think we're going to see people fleeing to freelancing if it's still able to exist independent of the PRO Act being implemented. Correct. I, I, absolutely right. And, and by the way, I'm a freelancer as well. I'm a contract worker and I'm a contract worker by choice. You know, in many ways, we create our hours, we do our jobs, we have an, an enjoy, we enjoy our you know, occupation in this area, but we also want a little more flexibility in our lives. And, and so I think that we have to watch this very closely and the language very closely. In a way, Gabby, I, I am somewhat optimistic that um, I think uh, Americans are wise to really what's happening, that they will give up their gig worker status very reluctantly, I think. Mm -hmm. And you certainly, I think we'll see this in the tech industry. I mean, people constantly point to Lyft or Uber, but the tech industry has a huge range of gig workers that deliberately want their lives to be fashioned according to what their times and hours you know, really uh, make them feel happy about. But um, in any case, the, the bill itself, the infrastructure bill, what one should really worry about is that uh, once the government starts to get into your life um, in these different areas, whether it's child care, whether it's elder care, you know, they normally, it normally has a tendency to be very inflationary. So what does that mean? That the child care and elder care portion, and I'll use that as an example, because the climate change issue is so muddled, I don't really understand at all why people still buy into the rhetoric, because it really hasn't done anything. Um, you know, in many ways, any, any enhancements in uh, emissions or emission controls have been really come primarily from the private sector, certainly not from the billions and tens of billions of failed government funding that's taken place over the last 15 years. So uh, essentially what happens is that the government funding goes into primarily to help people of lesser means. Okay, fair enough, you know, to get childcare or to get care for aging parents. But what happens is it pushes up the pricing of the services. Once government money starts flowing into one area, it pushes up the pricing of these services significantly so that people in middle income 
once again, it's that middle income segment of our population, the people making between maybe 70 and 120,000 or whatever you're talking about, um, that really feel the bulk of the pain of those price increases. The same thing happened with college tuitions, right? When the average college tuition has risen by 200% over the last 20 years versus inflation rising by 50%, a lot of that has happened because of government funding um, that really came in to help the lower income college tuition um, uh, student. But the point is, is that it pushed up tuitions for everyone across the countries to levels that are almost unsustainable. That is very true. And I think a lot of people have misplaced anger at the private sector for that rather than the government when it comes to student loans. I luckily didn't have to default on student loans. I paid them off and I had a little help from my parents too, but I had scholarship and some other things. But um, a lot of people I think were led down the wrong path with respect to that. And I think, what is it now? They're doing some sort of forgiveness. I remember seeing an announcement that they're going to forgive some semblance. I forget what, what denomination. Military. Um, oh, military. Okay. Target, yes, military uh, people. Um, and there's that is still not off the table. So it's it's still part of the discussion. You know, again, I think they've gotten so much pushback because there's just no way to really do this. It's a $1.6 trillion student debt dilemma. And how do you forgive student debt for one group of people after many, many working families have suffered, including students to really pay off their loans or to really address their debt? And then what does that mean for students future students that will accumulate even bigger debt loads given that the average tuition has ex escalated so much. My alma mater now has a student tuition this year of $76,000. Goodness. Room and board. So, you know, we're not addressing universities and colleges responsibility in terms of why are these tuitions going up so dramatically? What is going to happen so that they temper their own perhaps over bloated administrative costs so that students don't have to bear the costs. I have to check my uh, stats, but to give you an example, Columbia University, I think has 51 diversity officers. Hmm. I mean, what happened with just having two or three? <laughs> you know, I think that um, the over bloating of administrative costs is something that universities should really be honest about with students these days. That was starting to come into fashion when I was finishing college. They were just unveiling the different diversity initiatives. We had maybe one or two, and I guess that could be appropriate, but 51? UCSD didn't even have that. Uh, correct. It's, it's, and, and they call them different names, Gabby, so I'm not sure. I want to be careful like to, to check my facts on sure. that, but, but again, let me just go back to what the fact is, is that there is significant administrative bloating going on. Indeed, in these universities. And so they have to be more honest than ever, not only about what their costs are all about, but also once you start paying these prices, students have to be ready and aware of how the job market is going to help their income uh, pay their student loans back. You know, how they have to start addressing that in issue, I think, more honestly as well. One interesting, I would say, outspoken opponent to the $3.5 trillion infrastructure bill is Senator Joe Manchin, who is seen as this broker of deals. And he has been called the most important man in Washington. And even he has said he is not going to support this. It is too much. It's going to increase the debt and deficit. He wrote a great op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And I think a lot of us have been like, oh my gosh, why have you been so flimsy elsewhere? But on this issue, he is really kind of towed the line well on it. He said he, it's too big of a number. It's going to create more problems. Do you sense that they're going to, there's going to be other Democrats like him speaking out against this? Is he going to be the only one? Maybe Cinema, uh, perhaps John Tester, Angus King, some of the others who come from states that are a little more purple or maybe lean more red? I think, um, I think it will be tight going at this point. Um, in fact, I, I actually feel more comfortable with Cinema than I do with Manchin, although mm. uh, Manchin's voice has, is a very powerful one. Um, they say that he's always ready to do business. So mm. I'm a little bit concerned as, as, as the weeks go on that the Democrats may offer him a deal that he may not be able to refuse to come right. on board. You know, so that's a concern. However, the, um, 
the, the, the bill is so huge and it's so disruptive in many ways. You know, uh, I think that, um, I think that it could be a legacy that Manchin doesn't want to get tied around his neck when it turns out that none of these spending plans really do anything to alleviate the problems that people face, you know, going forward. I'm sympathetic to child care issues. I'm sympathetic to elder care is a big problem um, that we have to deal with in, in times again. But the notion that private sector solutions can't address these issues to me is as misguided today as it ever has been. Unfortunately, it seems that this administration's goal is to make it so that government is the arbiter of all reforms, yeah. change. I think people can be open to different issues. And also I saw some things in the infrastructure bill, um, issues that I would largely support as standalone bills in conservation and outdoor space. And I was very concerned why they were attached as writers to these infrastructure bills. And I can understand water infrastructure, but some things that shouldn't belong in infrastructure were included uh, when they would be much more preferable in standalone bills. I understand some people are like, well, we have to attach it to get it passed, but I don't, I don't think you necessarily need to do that. I understand that's how rulemaking goes in Washington, but I was disappointed that they included things that I generally support in a very bloated, convoluted package such as this. And, and as a result, I can't support it because of just the, the level of spending that it would do. Um, so, so people can agree with different things, but packaging it in just a one size fits all bill, I think is largely impractical to do. And I don't think they're going to be able to support to get support for it. And they shouldn't because of just the lack of, I guess, disbursement. How, how is the money going to be spent? A lot of people have reported the different pork projects that are entailed with this uh, proposed infrastructure bill as well. So people are worried that the taxpayer money is going to be further wasted and further abused. I I couldn't agree more. And um, an interesting way, I mean, you're really addressing is that we are all, we are almost overcome by the politics of this situation. And I think Americans aren't uh, naive to think that politics haven't always been a part of it. But I think the way Pelosi is addressing this is that she's determined to pass the most progress, leave a legacy as the most progressive Democrat, you know, to pass the biggest bill possible. And I think she's willing to, uh, and I, the Wall Street Journal wrote an article about this that I think is relevant, that she's willing to throw the centrist Democrats over the bus, you know, <laughs> uh, over the, to, to really, she's going to be retiring soon. She's not going to be there forever. And so she wants to leave this progressive legacy as her mark. And she's willing to take down a lot of, I think, good thinking people here. And they have to do it this year, Gabby, by the end of 2021, because once you get into the election year, the midterms mm -hmm. next year, there's a lot of vulnerability that's building. Biden has a lot of vulnerability with the way Afghan mm -hmm. uh, Afghanistan was handled. And so I think there could be a lot of pushback with this recent vaccine, you know, agenda. Um, it'll be interesting to see who they fire in the federal government, <laughs> you know, what shape and demographic these people may be. Um, if you really think about the vaccine issue and how that's going to be handled. So I think they're really trying to just throw the Hail Mary pass here, uh, go for the long ball and see what, see how it sh shakes out. I remember this in the first Obama term that was to enact a lot of pain and then they suffered ramifications politically in probably the most consequential defeat of Democrats in 50, 60 years. When Republicans retook the House, I think it was a 60 plus seat gain by Republicans. Right. I don't know what it'll be this year. I don't know if it could ever be at that level again. But uh, the political calculus, I don't really think they're aware of it. They don't think that they can lose. They think that the majority of the country agrees with their agenda. And let's say they pursue this, they pass the infrastructure bill, but it seems like there's a lot of roadblocks to passage from a lot of centrist Democrats who are very concerned that their constituents would not want this, especially Cinema, maybe Mark Kelly um, and some of the others from, purple, like I said, purple or reddish states who say like, yeah, this is even a bit too much for us. Uh, we normally would go along with this is not fiscally tenable. This is kind of uh, wasteful and it's going to have ramifications and saddle people with more debt than we already have, because uh, that's what I recall seeing in the op-ed from Manchin. 
um, his concerns. So even he right. understood. Um, but like you said, sometimes he is enticed by projects in exchange for support. That's what he did with the PRO Act, actually. He was kind of skeptical of the aims of the PRO Act, but he was promised some clean energy jobs, something in exchange right. for support. So he can be a little bit malleable, but maybe he will stand firm on this. When he usually writes op-eds, he usually stands firm on that issue. I think that's what he did with Neera Tandon's nomination as well. Yes. yes. I think you're absolutely correct. I think this one is so extreme and they're throwing everything into it that I think that it's worth really, uh, can, really, um, I'd say it's a, it's a good bet that he'll stay firm, you know, where he is at. Um, and mostly because of the legacy that mm -hmm. I think the Democratic Party could be left with um, as they look forward beyond, you know, 2021. Um, so. Yeah. What are you particularly working on with Freedom Works? Obviously, you deal a lot with uh, healthcare savings, uh, senior issues. What should my viewers and watchers be aware of? And, and what also is Freedom Works focusing on kind of in a big picture sense? Well, they're certainly focusing on this 3.5 trillion in a very big way. So they're out there. Uh, as you know, we have um, thousands, tens of thousands of activists that are really out there talking to the issue in their neighborhoods, communities. Um, and so that's that's a big one. Um, we started the year with HR1 and the Voting mm. Rights Act. And, and there are a lot of people, certainly on the Republican side, concerned about you know, uh, election security. Mm. Um, uh, but the, the, big, the big fight that I will be you know, focused on will be on how the Democrats decide they're going to come up with a plan to pay for um, these uh, spending bills. And so increasing corporate tax, corporate income tax, we really want to show how that impacts you as an employee um, of corporations and companies, how it really lowers productivity issues, why, in fact, we are winners when the corporate income tax was taken down to 21%, why that made a big difference in expanding the economy, opportunity and employment. And the last thing we want is to raise corporate income taxes again. We wanna be careful with the capital gains tax. There is amazing misconception on how capital gains taxes are directly related to investment in both the public and the private sector. Um, by that, I mean public securities mm -hmm. and really why it makes a difference in pension fund performance and in your 401k and IRA performance, it makes a big deal of difference in how companies, how your investments perform. And then finally, uh, income taxes. Um, those are the three tax issues that will be addressed um, as we come into probably November, Gabby. Mm -hmm. And I'll be focused on really helping people see the correlation between those taxes and your IRA. How about the death tax? I know there has been toying of it, of its reintroduction, and that has actually divided Democrats uh, against Biden. Uh, well, it's you're probably referring to, yeah, the estate tax. Estate they've, tax, yes. They've cut that to in the background. What they're really after is stepped up basis. And stepped up basis is the... Um, is the tax provision that allows you as a long time, say real estate owner, if the real estate or your property or your business has gone up in value significantly, you can pass it on to your heirs, whoever they may be, your children, your grandchildren, friends, uh, at no tax. It doesn't take into account any of the gains that have taken place in the real estate value over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. You can pass it on without any tax onto your heirs. What they really want to do is take a, a capital gains aspect of it. Did I make that clear enough? You know, yeah, so you did. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That's our basis. So they, uh, the, the, to compromise, Biden has said there will be a provision for two and a half million dollars. So if your property has gone up by two and a half million dollars, you can pass that on tax free onto your uh, children or grandchildren or any other relatives. And that includes farms. They may carve out a position for farms and say you can pass that on without any taxes. They're trying to go after, stepped up basis was really a real estate lobby effort that came into play years ago. And in many ways, um, that's been billion dollar a multi-billion dollar opportunities for uh, real estate holders to pass on their properties onto their families with no tax. 
Fascinating stuff. We have covered a wide range of issues relating to spending, labor, taxes. Clara, this has been very informative. Where can everyone follow your musings and connect with you and our Freedom Works? Um, I, you can find me uh, on uh, freedomworks.org, where I have uh, blogs on uh, retirement readiness, uh, economic issues affecting your savings, your IRA and 401ks, and any legislation that may be impacting down the road. Fabulous. Thank you so much for speaking with me. I think people will take a great interest in this. We still care about fiscal issues. I think in the center right space, they're very important. A lot of us who are up and coming in business, run businesses, need to know about these things once we enter an older age. So grateful that you were able to share your insight into this and what we need to worry about. So thank you, Clara. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Gabby. It's been a pleasure.